Hey, everybody. So glad to have you in the house. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Ernie. And uh, Pastor Randy was detained. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. And today. in the last we're moment, I, I won't steal yeah. the thunder of that. But so glad. So glad you're here. We hope that you feel the spirit of God because this is what we're going to for eternity. We're going to be in this together. And so glad you're here today. But the man who's about to speak, I, I've known him since he was a young man and went to every camp, not camp, Just to but clarify, I'm trip. still a young man. Yeah, uh, not really, not really. <laughs> You're <laughs> reaching that pretty soon. You'll be like the rest of us, yeah. a fat old guy. Yeah. But uh, listen, I, I've always been impressed with this man, his love for God and his love for people. And uh, this is Rob Pesky, and just recently, he'll probably tell you about it. He's been brought on staff, and he'll probably tell you about that too. But we couldn't be more proud of what God is doing in your life and what you're letting him do. Can't wait to hear what, how God's going to use you today, my friend. Yeah, I can't wait either. Okay. We'll see how this goes. Okay. Yeah. I don't need that. I got a thing. Yeah, he doesn't day, have so a yeah. note up here, my friend. Uh, yeah, or maybe I wrote it all. You don't yeah, need this so. one. But let's welcome, let's welcome Rob, okay? Thank you. Thank you. I was actually hoping you'd applaud at the end, more so at the beginning, but I'll, I'll take what I can get, so... Good morning, Aspire. Uh, thanks for being here today. I'm so glad that you could be here with us. I also want to take a second and just welcome uh, anyone who might be watching online on our live stream, or maybe you're tuning in later and watching this uh, down the road. I appreciate your time. I think time is one of the, the things in life you don't get any more of, and the fact that you're spending it here with us is really a blessing. So I, I want you to know we take that seriously. And I'm grateful for you being, being here with us. Like I said, my name is Rob Pesky, and uh, I'm kind of in a weird place right now. Uh, I just, as Ernie said, uh, was hired at Inspire to be a pastor in training is the official title, uh, but I don't actually start until September 1st, so I'm technically still a volunteer, which means if this doesn't go well, you can't fire me yet. <laughs> You'll have to wait till September to fire me, um, but hopefully it doesn't go that badly. I'm excited to be here. Um, I haven't taken any seminary classes yet. I'm, I'm not on the payroll. It's just I'm doing my best. Um, I, I'm joking, of course, but um, if you're visiting and you're kind of new to Inspire, we actually do have a head pastor who's a half-decent preacher. Um, <laughs> we've, we've had a lot of trouble getting him to show up for work uh, lately. Uh, if, you, if you've been here for a couple weeks, uh, Pastor Ernie preached last week, or did you do two weeks? I don't know. I can't remember the last time I saw Randy. So anyway, uh, but I would encourage you, especially if you're new or newer to Inspire, come back and listen to him. He is a great pastor. He's a great preacher, and I think you'd get a lot out of um, a sermon by him, uh, but he's on vacation. And, and I'm quoting now, he said, due to a scheduling snafu, which I think means uh, I wasn't really paying attention when my wife told me the dates. Um, he, he's still on vacation today. And, you know, we, we give him a hard time for that, but ministry is intense. And I've worked in churches before, and I've spent a lot of time doing ministry, and, and we need to give our, our staff, our pastors especially, time to, to just unplug and disconnect and take care of their own spirits and their own families and stuff from time to time. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here and to uh, give Randy that time off. I'm saying a lot of this because I'm sure he's watching right now and I don't want him to fire me. Um, but, but seriously, uh, there is something kind of special about starting a new job where you feel like the boss already owes you a favor. You know what I mean? Because like for real people, he, he texted me on Wednesday and said, hey, I might not be there Sunday, so you might have to preach. Oh, okay, cool. But I'll let you know Thursday or Friday if you're going to do that. So... <laughs> So awesome. So I think if I play my cards right, I might end up with a parking spot here when this is all said and done. So, No? Oh. Shoot, shoot. Anyway, I hope you get something out of this service today. Uh, when Randy texted me, uh, he said I could talk about uh, a couple of things that he thought might be interesting for you to listen to. Uh, I could talk about the calling I've been feeling in my life, especially related to this whole pastor thing that's been going on. Um, he also mentioned that, you know, we've been doing this series about um, is atheism dead, and so the topic he had kind of assigned today was what in creation or what in, like, nature do you see that kind of convinces you that there is a God? Um, and over the course of the, the summer, it's been really great listening to the series. If you've missed a week, I encourage you to go back and check it out. Um, Randy's done a neat job of, of looking at all of the science around faith and looking at it more from the perspective of what it says to the alternatives to God instead of maybe even what proves that God exists, but what, what is the alternative if he doesn't? So I encourage you to check those out. Uh, I thought about it, and today I'm going to do my best to kind of give you a little bit of both topics. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how I ended up here today, also uh, where I think we can find God in creation, 
and maybe more importantly, how we can kind of share that experience with others, uh, with the other people around us. So let's get to it. Uh, let's go ahead and stand for our reading of Scripture. Kids, this is the best part of the day. You get to head out that way with our youth people, and they're going to take you to Children's Church and have some fun while we try to stay awake in here. Today's reading comes from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ has the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Here ends today's reading. You may be seated. Thank you. As I said, my name is Rob Pesky. I was born and raised in uh, Bismarck by good Christian parents who are in this room right now. Uh, whenever I get nervous on stage, I can always kind of catch my breath because for however nervous I am, I know my mom is way more nervous right now. Um, so I'll try my best not to embarrass you, mom. Um, I, uh, I majored in music education and music performance out at the University of Mary here in town. Um, while I was there, I met the woman of my dreams. Her name's Nicole, and I know a lot of you know her. And we got married. Uh, we have three kids. Okay, this is, oh, there, thanks, Becky. I'm trying to figure out how to use the remote here, but that's, that's my family that you can see there. Uh, ben is way over on the right side for you guys. He is uh, 16 years old, and he's at Century High School. Uh, Evan is on the opposite end by me there, and he's thir almost 13. His birthday's in like two weeks, which he's told us about for a long time now. Um, but he'll be 13 this year, and he goes to Horizon. Um, they are everything and more that I've ever wanted in sons. I'm very proud of them and, and who they are as young men, and it's great. Our daughter Emily is 11. She's right there in the middle. Uh, she is going to Centennial Elementary School. Uh, we adopted Emily from Bulgaria nine years ago, which is kind of crazy to say out loud because it feels like it was not that long ago. Um, I'm going to try very hard not to use Emily's story in every single sermon that I preach for the rest of my life, um, but it's, it's but for the record, if, if you need to know that God is real or you, you really want to grow in your faith or you just want to see miracles happen on a regular basis, uh, adopt a child. Uh, it's just been a, a profound experience for my whole family. Uh, I always tell people it will ruin your life in all of the right ways. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that for now. But uh, if you ever want to talk about adoption, my wife and I love talking about it with people. Uh, fun fact, uh, perhaps the easiest way to get an invitation to dinner at our house is to say, hey, we'd like to talk to you about adoption sometime. Uh, instantaneously, it will be on the calendar, and we will cook for you and feed you and your whole family. And I'm, uh, I hate to brag, but my wife makes the best cheesecake in the entire world. So if any of you have ever felt like that's something you are interested in or curious about, let us know, and we will trick you into it. Um, it'll be fun. So speaking of my wife, uh, I do want to pause for just a minute and thank all the people who have reached out to her uh, in support of this new transition in my life into uh, ministry. Uh, in her words, uh, she signed up to be the band director's wife. Uh, she never thought she'd be the pastor's wife. Um, the support from all of you has been amazing, and I just want to thank you all for that. So uh, if you've reached out to her, just thanks a lot for that. Uh, speaking of pastor's wives, here we go, see if it works. There, there we go, look at that. Uh, this is Chris Hockett. She's Pastor Ernie's wife. Uh, oh, man, yeah. Speaking of married up, yeah, that's the way to go, buddy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I had, a, I had a, a brief conversation with Chris just last week, um, and it just, what, what we talked about really had a deep impact on me as I was looking at this whole uh, changing my career thing into the pastor thing. Uh, she said, are you sure that was God talking to you? It's like, oh, cool. And of course I responded, no, <laughs> I'm not sure. And, uh, you know, we laugh, but it's kind of true. You know, I don't know if you've had that experience, but how do you know if God is talking to you? Uh, I have prayed a lot. I, I have spent a lot of time reading the Bible. I've talked to family and friends. Uh, recently, I've been talking to a bunch of people at different seminaries, and um, I feel like I've gotten signs confirming my calling. 
but there hasn't really been like a burning bush. Like, wouldn't that be great? Like you're walking down the street, a burst lights in the f- a bush lights on fire and says, hey, Rob, this is what you should do. Um, I can't say that I've had that, that intense sort of moment. And I, I would imagine that, you know, there's been all these signs, but then I start to wonder, am I overanalyzing this? Do you ever do that? Like you're, you're, you're thinking about something like, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? And you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you hit like five green lights in a row and you're like, clearly God is speaking to me through these stop signs. <laughs> the green light means I need to go and I need to do this. And, and maybe they're all just timed or something. Or, or my favorite is like, uh, I'll see a butterfly out and like, oh, look at that butterfly. It's so beautiful. Clearly God loves me and wants me to buy ice cream, you know. <laughs> But we kind of do that, don't we? We look for signs, we look for, for indications of what, what God has for us, and I know for me, um, that's been something that I've wrestled with. I know God loves me, and he wants what's good for me, but it's, it's hard to know what, what he actually wants us to do. Um, if God is speaking to us, we can't even answer that question until we kind of address the original question of today, is, is, is God even real? Does he exist? Is, uh, he can't, certainly can't speak to you if he's real. Uh, Randy's question today is, what thing in creation convinced me there is a God? Now, I think when he asked this, he was thinking about creation and what inspires a sense of awe and wonder at God. Um, I know he's been out at the lake cabin for the last week or so, and I'm sure he's looking at these beautiful nature scenes and going, how could, not, how could God not be real? Look at these trees, look at this lake, these, these beautiful answers. Uh, I have to be honest, I'm not a big fan of nature. And my friends who know me, uh, I have spent my entire life working very hard to never have to sleep in a tent. I love my house. It's air conditioned most of the time. It's heated in the winter. I'm not like a big nature guy. I know this is kind of blasphemy this time of year because uh, we don't get a lot of time when nature even like lets us live outside. Um, but it is something that um, I, wrestle, I wrestle with. So anyway... So if you allow it, I'd like to modify the question just a little bit for today. I'd like to talk about how I know God is real, and I'll let Randy worry about camping and stuff like that later. So, To be honest, I'm kind of embarrassed at how difficult it has been for me to answer this question. I just signed up to be a pastor, and I don't know what to say the first time that someone looks at me and says, how do you know there's a God? I think my favorite part of this sermon series that we've been in is that we've turned the question around. Instead of, how do you know there's a God, we've kind of been asking, how do we know there, how could you know that there is not a God? And I'm just curious, has anyone ever asked anybody that question? We always think we have to defend God, and sometimes I think it might be easier just to make them defend the other alternative to that too. I do think that would be a really interesting conversation to have with somebody, and I'm, I'm hoping someday down the line I get to have it. But the question remains, how do I, Rob Pesky, pastor in training, soon-to-be seminary student, fingers crossed, uh, know that God is real? It's a tough question. I actually woke up at 4.30 a.m. on Thursday in a cold sweat trying to think of an answer. Um, To be honest, I was not in my best mindset. I don't know if you've had that experience. You wake up at 4.30 and you can't sleep and there's all these things running through your head. Uh, And so I did what everybody does when they have an important question on their mind. I Googled it. And... uh, (laughs) You want to know what I found at 4.30 a.m. Thursday morning, you know, two, three days before I'm supposed to preach on this topic, I typed into Google, evidence for God's existence, and I hit enter, and this is what showed up. No lasting scientific evidence of God's existence has been found. Therefore, in the case of a worldview that relies solely on scientific evidence, whether or not God exists is unknown, or even God does not exist, de- exist depending on the strength of such a worldview. Thanks, Wikipedia. That's really helpful. And, it, and just to make it better, my computer actually highlighted the first line for me, just in case I wasn't quite getting what was, uh, what was there. Uh, it was probably good we sent the kids out before this part of the sermon. So I'm sitting there looking at this. I'm like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I made a mistake. Um, but the good news is, I scrolled down a little further, and fortunately, the posts after that were more encouraging. Uh, I really like this one. According to theguardian.com, a scientist has calculated that there's a 67% chance that God exists. All right. Dr. Steve Unwin Unwin has used a 200-year-old formula to calculate the probability of the existence of an omnipotent being. Whew. That was close. I was safe. So the message today is, folks, is just play the odds. You know, 67%, you've got a better chance of winning 
betting on God than not. So anyway, um, that was close. I guess to be honest, uh, if you're really struggling with this question, there are some really good resources out there. As I scrolled through them, um, there's some very scholarly sources uh, with great arguments and interesting facts for you to chew on. Uh, I think the truth is, though, most people have kind of made up their minds on this topic. And I don't know that a lot of fancy arguments and statistics and research is going to have much of an impact. If you believe, you'll find and appreciate the stuff that reinforces that belief. And if you don't, you'll find the stuff that supports that view, too. The moral of the story is I, I really don't think Google has the answer. Um, so here we are, back to the original question. What in creation proves to Rob Pesky, pastor in training, that God is real? My answer is probably too simple for you. It's the Bible. I brought my Bible today. I got this in uh, middle school or high school. I think it was like a confirmation present. And I confess I don't actually use it a lot. I'm mostly a, an app guy. I read on my phone or my iPad and stuff. But I wanted to bring it today because we're going to talk about it a little bit. The stories and the lessons and the history of this book have convinced me over and over and over that God is real. Uh, I've read the whole thing several times, and I'm sure many of you have too. Certain sections I have read over and over and over. And when I'm struggling with something, I try to go there, and it almost always helps. This book is so rich, and it makes so much sense, and it also makes no sense at all. I don't know if you've had that experience where you're reading this and like, what is going on here? Um, over the last year, it really has been a lifeline for me. Um, I have been a music teacher since I was 16 years old. I taught my first drum lesson at Bismarck High School. I was a German foreign exchange student who eventually got shipped off because he was in jail. Um, <laughs> but it got better after that. Um, some of you, probably a lot of you, know that my dad is a music teacher. And if you don't know, my dad's the guy with the guitar up here, Bubba. Um, a lot of you maybe don't know that in addition to that, my grandfather, my mother's dad, was also a band director. He was the band director at Bismarck High School for a long time. They even not named like the Canock Center after Gordon Canock, my grandfather. Uh, when my wife married me 20 years ago, as I said before, she planned to be the band director's wife. I majored in music education and music performance. This is, that's what I am, that's what I do. I was born and raised to teach music in this town. Last November, when I started considering leaving my whole life as a music teacher, I started reading through the Psalms. I did it in a new way for me. Uh, each day, I read one chapter, but I would read it three times in a row, just boom, 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 boom. I heard uh, someone talking about that around that time that said this is a good way to chew on Scripture, because you see the ending, and then you see the beginning, and it's easier to see how stuff kind of connects to each other. Um, I have read the Psalms before, and as many of you probably have, I do have to say, if you have never read the Psalms during a period of your life when you're kind of in distress or you're wrestling with some major things, uh, I don't know if you've really read them. There are so many days that I would be reading a chapter and be just dumbfounded at the words. How on earth could someone have written this 3,000 years ago and it speaks directly to what I'm experiencing right now today in my living room? It was profound. The absurdity of, this, of the coincidences I experienced during this time was just mind-blowing. It was just, I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, one in particular comes to mind. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Psalm 27. It starts out with this, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Uh, does that sound familiar? We've probably heard this psalm before. Um, what really caught me was the very end of the chapter, and it says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. I had been telling God that I was eager for him to return and make all things new. But frankly, I was running out of patience. I was miserable at work. And in addition to that, there was the added weight of feeling like there was nothing else I could do. I was born to be a music teacher, and it was killing me slowly every single day. The part that hit me was this, the highlighted part, that I would experience the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I had kind of reserved myself to like, yeah, I know I'm going to go to heaven and God's going to make all things new and it'll be good, but we're just meant to suffer for the rest of our lives here. And that really struck me as something that's not true, that God loves us now, that he's with us now and he wants us to have joy in life now. That 
verse spoke to me profoundly in that moment. Has that ever happened? Have you experienced that? Has that happened to you? Something in Scripture just jumps out at you and says, John, this is for you. This is about you. Pay attention. This happened to me constantly during the last year of my life and is a big part of why I'm standing here today. After reading this psalm, I felt like God was telling me, I've got you. Quit your job. I have a plan. Trust me. And so that's what I did. I didn't know where I would go next, but I decided to quit and trust God to figure it out. Of course, I know now that this is eventually what led to me starting here as a pastor. One thing that was really, really hard for me during this time is that I felt like God was telling me to wait. I am not a waiter, okay? I am a worker, okay? To just do nothing does not resonate with me. That's not how I'm wired, okay? I'm going to do it. If I see something that needs to be done, I just do it. The word I got from the Lord was wait for me. Now, uh, gentlemen in the room, I don't know if you've ever left a job without plans for a new job, uh, but FYI, that is not a great way to impress your wife. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned, she is the woman of my dreams, and you could not have asked for a more supportive wife during this time. She was and is amazing, but she also really likes the house that we live in and felt very strongly we should continue making payments on that house. <laughs> Um, having a husband who was just waiting for a new job to magically fall into his lap was not her ideal career path for me. Um, at one point, I decided that I would wait until June 1st. And, and again, this is back in like January, February. And on June 1st, I would start looking if nothing had shown up yet. That was kind of the deal we made, and she, she was fine with that and supportive of that. Um, fast forward to the end of the school year, sometime in May, um, Pastor Randy saw me at church, and you know, I told him that I was quitting my job and looking for something else. And he said, hey, we should get together and talk sometime. I want to know what's happening in your life. Um, I've got a, kind of a busy week. Are you available Thursday? And I said, yeah, Thursday's good. And I opened up my calendar to put on my calendar. Anyone want to guess what the date was that Thursday? It was June 1st. It was the day in January I decided I'm not going to even think about a new job until June 1st, and then we'll figure it out from there. And that's the day that Randy picked to meet. Uh, don't you just love a, a coincidence like that? Things just kind of line up. Um, so we met, and that was the day that I, I told him, you know, I've kind of thought about this. I've thought about being a pastor. What do you think about this? Again, there was no burning bush. It wasn't like I said, I definitely should be a pastor. And he was very supportive. And then what I didn't know at the time was basically after lunch, he got in a car and drove to Texas. And I think the wheels started to turn. Da -da 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 -da. And, and he came back, and he was very supportive, and we've talked and met since then, stuff like that. Um, now, here's the, again, the crazy thing. I'm going to try to go one deeper with you, and it's, it's hard to do. Have you ever seen one of those movies where they travel like forward and backwards in time, and you never know exactly which time period you're looking at? Okay? I've had a week like that. Okay? So go back with me a couple days. It's Thursday morning. I'm frantically working on this sermon, and I remembered... This, this story of Psalm 27, and I remember the part about in the land of the living, and I couldn't remember which psalm it was, so I googled in the land of the living psalms, and uh, fortunately this time uh, Google helped me out, and I found that it was Psalm 27, and easy peasy. I said, I'm going to reread the chapter, make sure I'm not taking stuff out of context right now, and, and just make sure everything lines up. And here is the rest of the chapter. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above my enemies who surround me. At the sacred tent, I will sacrifice with slouches of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Okay, so that's the rest of the verse. I kind of skipped to the middle. If you look at the stuff that's highlighted... Dwell in the house of the Lord. Seek him in his temple. Keep him safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. Does that sound like the day in the life of a pastor to anyone else? And just to make sure that I'm not an idiot and missed it, he adds at the bottom, I will sing and make music to the Lord. Just in case the music major, professional musician, uh, is so dense that he doesn't quite catch on. You guys, this book changed my life. I was desperate, and this book changed my life when I was desperate. And then circled back around six months later, 
almost to like say, see, I told you so. This is one example. I have more, uh, but I, I'm going to save those for other sermons because I'll have to do this again someday, I imagine. <laughs> when I'm asked what convinced you that God is real, the shortest answer I can give is this book. Do you want to experience God? Read the book. Do you want to grow in your faith? Read the book. Do you need comfort? It's in the book. Are you celebrating? This book is full of parties. It's all here. My oldest son, Ben, came back from Bible camp last week. He and about 30 folks from Inspire uh, went down to this camp that's called Nebuiodec, which is like an abbreviation of Nebraska, Wyoming, and Dakota. And uh, they had a great week. They've done this for years. If your kids haven't been, send them. It's, it's every year they come back just on fire. And, and just like that, my son came home. And, you know, the first morning back, I find him laying in his bed, staring at his phone. I'm like, great. Back home from camp, I guess. And I, my dad instincts kick in. I'm like, what are you looking at? And he, 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 so I kind of surprised him. He goes, oh, sorry. And this is what he says. He goes, it's amazing how fast time flies when you're using the Bible app. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> is there a better thing a child could say when he's looking at his cell phone? I was like, this is incredible. Uh, he was setting up uh, Bible studies on there for himself to do. And he's like, there's just so many, I can't decide. And in addition to that, he also set up Bible studies for the guys on the trip. He's got this group of guys that he's been going on. And, stuff. and so they're doing this Bible study together. You guys, the kid is addicted. He's doing studies on his own. He's studying with others. The book is speaking to him. He's 16 years old. It's speaking to his friends. And it can speak to you too. Um, now, there's one thing I don't like about my answer when I say what convinced you guys real and I say the Bible. What I don't like about this answer is, well, let me say this. I realize that most of you here are believers, and many of you know your Bibles, maybe even better than I do. Um, I don't need to convince you. You get it. Uh, you're drinking the Kool-Aid, as they say. The answer is true, but it's almost meaningless to, peop to people who are unbelievers, if you say that to them. Remember our, our scripture reading at the beginning? The message of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. Um, I can't get people to read an entire Facebook post when it shows up on their phone in front of their faces. I know that I can't get them to read this huge book and reflect on it. People still ask me, why do you believe? But I can't just tell them the Bible tells me so. Uh, it won't that doesn't mean anything to someone who doesn't believe there's anything going on in the first place. So in order to keep them from rolling their eyes uh, on the rare occasion that someone actually asks me about my faith, my answer is also pretty simple. I just tell them, come and see. The other thing that jumps out at me as proof that God is real is the church. And to be clear, I don't mean just inspire family fellowship, although I do believe that we are part of what I'm talking about. I'm referring to the people that Jesus left here on earth to make disciples of all nations. Sometimes that means a building like this, where people gather to worship and grow in faith, but it really just means the people who are doing their best to follow Jesus. I have another dangerous confession to make today. My favorite radio station in town is the Catholic radio station. Uh, I love listening to these brilliant people discuss topics of faith and tradition and history. I learn something almost every day. Uh, to be fair, I don't always agree with everything I hear on that station, which I think is why I'm a Lutheran, so you know, don't be afraid. Uh, but I love listening to the questions and the answers and seeing where I fit into that particular uh, denomination or way of looking at faith. For me, it's really fun to hear what people are asking about God and then hear what these smart people are saying back to them. This week, someone asked the question about the church, and the host talked about the word for church in the Bible. Does anyone know what like, the original Greek word in the church for in the Bible for churches, anyone know? It's ek ecclesia, okay? Ecclesia. Um, and does anyone know what that literally translates out as? Ernie, don't ruin it for everybody. There's always one kid in the class who's like got all the answers, okay? You know, it's, it's, it's in the front row and everything, so. It literally means the called out ones. The called out ones, people who are called out. Um, the, the more I think about that, the more I like it. The, building is not, the, the church is not a building or a location, but a group that has been called out. I like that a lot. And Randy's gone and we're still speaking Greek. <laughs> oh yeah, I, we'll get to C.S. Lewis next week. So. <laughs> Folks, 
we can spend years researching, studying, memorizing, and learning everything we can about the Bible, about science, about our universe, and about the human genome, and we can know every fact and every argument for why God is real. And it won't make a bit of difference to the world if we don't show them love. Come and see. Invite them to your house for dinner, and let them see a place that is a bit messy but filled with joy and thanksgiving. Invite them to come and see this uh, crazy church that is full of imperfect people doing their best to live in a community filled with love and grace and understanding. If you are here today and you are wrestling with these types of questions, is God real? What am I doing here? Who is God? I want you to come and see. You are so welcome here and you can ask these questions and you can wrestle with faith and you will be sitting next to other people who have asked these questions and are largely still trying to figure out the answers to those questions. While you wrestle, pray. Read the book. Engage in this thing that he calls the church. Um, remember, we aren't perfect. No one here is. The only one who ever got it right was Jesus, and he loves you so much. Um, he loved you so much that he died for you on the cross so that your sins could be forgiven and you could spend eternity with him and his family. He calls us the church. I know it because I've read the book and I've experienced it over and over in my life. Just this morning, we were sitting here before church and uh, Pastor Ernie and I were sitting in the back and, you know, if you don't love Ernie, I'm sorry, there's something wrong with you. Amen. You should find somewhere else to worship. Yeah. Chris has fixed a lot of problems in that house. Um, but we were talking about Inspire and how proud we are of this church and how safe we are we feel we are to invite people. We want people to feel welcome here. And the reason we feel that way is the people sitting in this room. You are, you are the church. You have been called out. We see you reaching out to each other. We see you volunteer. We see you giving. We see these things. And the things that embarrass us about our church are also the things we love. For instance, my brother. Um, yeah. But we want this to be a place that's real and, and open to people. And we want you to be a part of it. I would just encourage you to come and see today and invite others to come and see. Don't wait for your burning bush. Take a step of faith and you will see. I promise. Let's, let's go ahead and pray, please. Dear God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for everyone in this room and I pray that you will, they will see you in their lives. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us through it. Lord, I lift up everyone here to you. If there's anyone who is looking for you, I pray that you would reach out to them and bring them into your presence in tangible ways. You are so good and so faithful, and we need you now in our lives. Forgive us when we fall short. Help us to be the men and women you made us to be, and thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. If you are here and you feel like maybe you'd like to know more about Jesus and the life he offers, we would love to talk with you. Uh, and pray with you after the service. You can talk to me. You can talk to Pastor Ernie, uh, our leaders up here on stage, or just about anybody around you. We don't claim to have all the answers, but we would love to search out those answers with you. Thank you for listening today. Have a wonderful week, church. Let's stand and worship. Mm -hmm.